Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for your attendance. And uh, we get uh, proceedings underway. Uh, you're all very welcome uh, to this uh, lunchtime address. Um, I'm just uh, always reminded at this stage, I get a note, and sometimes I ignore it, but I have it in front of me, so I'll remember to remind you to not so much to necessarily switch off your mobile phone, because, but, because you're welcome to use it to tweet if you're that way inclined to the course of the presentation. Uh, but I'll say something about the Q&A in a minute. But if you want to tweet, please do. But if you could keep your phone on silent, uh, that would help us so there aren't any unnecessary uh, in interruptions. Uh, so we go through until about 2 o'clock. Our guest, whom I'll introduce in a moment, will speak for, I suppose, what, 20 minutes or so, maybe a little more. We're flexible in that regard. And then we'll have a Q&A session. The presentation um, is presentation on the record, but we, we usually say that for the Q&A that we apply Chatham House rules, so that if there's a question that maybe our guest would like the flexibility, shall we say, to be able to answer uh, in, in, a, in a particular way, that we don't, we don't, quote, we don't quote our guests in the, from the Q&A session. So the Chatham House rules, you can say what you heard, but you're not supposed to say where you heard it or from whom you heard it, that sort of thing, but you'll, you'll appreciate they're the kind of rules that we apply here uh, and usually work uh, very well. Um, and when you ask a question, please identify yourself. Just say who you are and whether you represent an organisation. If you don't, that's fine. You're very welcome here. Our guest this afternoon is Matt McGrath, uh, sitting beside me. Matt is the Environment Correspondent uh, of uh, the BBC. He will be uh, addressing us in a personal capacity, um, though, this afternoon. Uh, you'll appreciate that. Um, but we're delighted to have him here. Uh, really a, a foremost, uh, one of the foremost journalists covering this uh, hugely Im uh, important issue. I'm inclined to say sometimes when we say it's a an issue, but as I think most of us will agree now, it's not really just another issue on the list of, of issues. And I think, as I think Matt will perhaps say himself, certainly we were discussing that a few minutes ago, it really is the issue uh, rather than an issue. Um, and I think for journalists and for j journalists as uh, accomplished as Matt, I think that's sometimes perhaps a, a, a difficult point to, uh, to communicate, that it isn't just another, and now we go to the environment correspondent for such a story, and after that education and after that health. It is of such overwhelming importance that it's hard, I think, for even perhaps for, uh, for journalists to, 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 to themselves make the kind of impact perhaps that they would like to, given the constraints that, them, that there are there in the media, certainly in the traditional media. Uh, so um, Matt, uh, as I've said to you, as you know, he's the environment correspondent, you'll be familiar with him. Uh, he covered Copenhagen, I know, he covered Paris. Um, I remember his, his stories on the uh, withdrawal, the US withdrawal from Paris. Um, but he has been covering this story for many years, and you couldn't, I think, identify a journalist who is uh, more experienced, more knowledgeable, and I think more insightful uh, on these questions uh, than Matt McGrath. As you will divine from his accent once you hear him, Matt is an Irishman from Tipperary, um, and um, he uh, is... Um, as I said, you know, has, has analysed and reported on many of these questions. He's a graduate of UCC, and he was a Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT. When I saw Knight, I kind of... It was spelt K-N-I-G-H-T, but in any event, uh, you can explain it to us if you wish, but it's, a, it's a, an impressive award from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was the science communicator in residence at York University in Toronto, also in 2018. There are many things we can say about Matt McGrath, but that would only be to take up too much of the time that we want to give to him to address us. Matt McGrath. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all very much and for your very, very warm welcome here. And thank you very much, Alex, for a very kind introduction. I'm hopefully this thing is on and I can be, I can be heard. Uh, and I'm trying to make my remote control work here and it doesn't seem to want to do that right now. So just bear with me one second until I can uh, get my slides to work. So, yeah, that should work. Yeah, covering the climate. That's what I'm here to talk about, uh, reporting on climate change, something I've been doing for quite a number of years. Um, it's a... Tricky and difficult issue, as I'm sure you're all aware, and we are uh, often in the limelight, I suppose, about uh, how we report it, and uh, often seems to be as much of an issue as the actual issue itself. Um, 
The glamorous life of BBC reporter is not something I'm very much familiar with, to be honest with you. Uh, I, 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 do, I, I love my job. It's great. I get to interview wonderful and interesting people about an interesting and complicated topic. Uh, but it's not, always the, it's not always the case like that. Um, let me just uh, give you an example of uh, one of my colleagues here. Oops, I'm going a bit too quick there. How's that going? Uh, that's my wonderful colleague, Alex Capstick. Oh, I'm going, I seem to be going backwards. Sorry about this. I'll try to use the machines. Sorry, a few technicals. If I stand down here, it might work a bit closer. No, it's all right, it's fine. Um, Alex Kapsik, a sports reporter, works for BBC, broadcasting live from an event. He's uh, here going live. This is his uh, camera person here in the middle. And obviously, he's a very hard-working producer over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's, not, it's not all fun and games, as they say, when we're out there, although it's, it, it is quite, quite a good thing to do, quite fun. Um, so I wanted to show you something about the kind of work that I do now and how it's changed a bit since... Um, so it goes here, can't stop. I'll just play that again in a second. Um, I work for uh, Radio TV and online. <clears throat> I write an awful lot of pieces for the website. I report on radio and I do TV as well. But obviously a, a major part of the way that things have changed in the last number of years is that we now produce what we call digital content. The phrase is, gets stuck in my throat sometimes. Um, and what that means is trying to reach newer, younger, different audiences with the, the range of knowledge that we have. And so the piece I'm going to show you is, it, it kind of falls into that category. It's a short piece we made in Katowice in Poland in December. Uh, and it's just kind of appealing to a younger audience. The style is slightly different. It's obviously subtitled. And it just gives you a sense of the kind of the way that things are changing right now. So if I can play that. I should be able to go back. I'm very sorry about this. This is the uh, perils of technology. Mm -hmm. dangerous. <laughs> There's the pictures. That's the that's the one you want to see. So that's the kind of thing we're kind of doing now. I mean, that's two minutes to explain the very complex UN process, what's going on, the background to it. And it, that, that piece worked really well. It was, it, was, it was shared widely on social media. It also went on TV as well. So you, you can see we're kind of moving towards, 
I, I know it's a little bit of dad dancing sometimes and you've got these older geezers trying to do this kind of younger stuff, but, but we're trying, the way we're trying to see it is that we, a lot of us have, have experience and knowledge going back a long time and we want to try and capture that in a way that, that appeals and can inform younger, younger audiences. And that's what we're trying to do really with that, with that kind of thing. Um, as Alex said, I've, I've, I've you know, done a number of fellowships. I think you know, working in this particular field it's, it's very complex, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information. I've been, I've been lucky enough to go to MIT, and I'm lucky enough to go to Stanford, and, and New York University, and other places. And it's, you know, it's the kind of thing that really helps you to stay informed, is to go and speak to scientists in, in, in places where you're not reporting, where you can sit down and have a conversation with them, and really kind of try and get to grips with what they're, what they're saying. Um, so, but, you know, sometimes you're doing all the kind of stuff, you're traveling around the world, and you can kind of get a bit carried away with yourself, uh, as, as Alex also said, I'm uh, from Tipperary. This is my father. He's a bee farmer down there. You can see his nice monkey trousers. And uh, he's the kind of guy who would bring me back down to earth with a bang very quickly. He said, no, put on a few pounds there, I see. Huh? Uh, camera never lies, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so whenever I need to feel the, uh, the, you know, the get back to my roots, he's, he's the man who will do it. Um, Ireland has also been, I think, a place I've learned uh, some key lessons in journalism. And one of those uh, I learned a good number of years ago involved uh, Albert Reynolds, the great uh, uh, former Prime Minister and Taoiseach of this, of this country. I was uh, sent here in the late 1990s to cover one of the general elections, and uh, Albert had been out of power for a couple of years. I went to interview him down in Longford. I took a radio car with me down from Belfast. Going to interview him live down there in Longford, so I drove down to Longford, got stuck on the roads, running late, all that kind of stuff. Ran into the Longford Arms Hotel. Is Mr. Reynolds here? Is Mr. Reynolds here? Mr. Reynolds, put his hand up. Come, Mr. Reynolds, come out, come out, come out to the radio car. I've got my satellite dish up, calling London. Come on, come on, come on, pick it up, pick it up. And um, I said, I've got Albert Reynolds here to do the interview, the, the live interview on the, on, on the one o'clock news. And then I had a little tap on my shoulder and says, um, I think you're looking for my brother. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, Jim Reynolds, Albert Reynolds' his older brother, who uh, loved nothing more than actually making a fool of a young BBC reporter. <laughs> like you might, I don't have time to check, I'll just stick, stick you on. That's the way mistakes are made. Anyway. Um, so I, that was a good lesson I learned here. Um, I, I, I'm very keen just to, just to touch on the way that we do climate reporting and how the, the history of this house come about. I found this piece in the New York Times from 1956, written by a man with the wonderful name of Waldemar Kainfurt. And it's, it's a really excellent piece of science. He was born in 1877. He died about a month after this article was written in 1956. And it puts forward this idea, this, you know, this kind of mad theory that carbon dioxide could account for climactic change. And he, he reports on this guy who said that basically to him, the carbon dioxide theory stands up, though it may take another century of observation and measurement of temperatures to confirm it. You know? Very, very interesting that he would have this insight, I guess, back in 1956. And of course, what happened? Nothing as a result. Um, here in Ireland, Irish Times, 1986, Michael Viney's piece in the Irish Times. You, and and, and I, I love his opening paragraph, which goes, uh, predicts that the greenhouse effect caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will have pushed up mean global temperatures by one degree Celsius from 1850 to the year 2000, and that the Earth can expect an additional warming of a few degrees over the next century. I mean, you could write that today. It's, it was prescient and brilliant. What I also like about this story is the headline, Heading for a Little Ice Age. And Michael Viney's last sentence in this piece says, I contacted biologist Dr. Edward Fahey, and he thought uh, he doesn't believe this greenhouse theory, and uh, we're heading for a little ice age. And so we get into this situation straight away from the earliest reporting of these stories, where we get sub-editors and editors conflicting with the body of the, of the actual evidence. So the story isn't about heading for a little ice age, it's about the fact that the world is, the world is warming. And it, and it kind of sets the scene for what's happened over the last 20 years or so, where we have... Editors who are unsure about the science of the story, wanting to be to, to cover all bases by actually having uh, climate deniers, climate skeptics, people with critical voices, gi giving them equal weight with scientists who are saying there's an issue. And this is across all media. It's across, um, uh, you know, the BBC has, 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 has certainly seen that. Um, newspapers have seen it. It's been widespread in the world. And in the BBC, there were a number of complaints at various times taken about the appearance of Nigel Lawson on uh, radio programs uh, when he would appear with a scientist and, you know, program producers uh, getting criticised for basically equating uh, some, an economist, essentially, with a scientist. And, you know, the, that practice ultimately led to a couple of inquiries, and in, internal inquiries in the BBC, and, 
you know, we moved on to a kind of a position now where we don't have to do that anymore. There's the climate skeptical voice. We don't have to represent a climate skeptical voice with every piece we do about climate change. And this has become widespread as well in the world. And it's become to the situation now where the BBC is moving on to do even more and using our perhaps the BBC's biggest asset, David Attenborough, to do a programme about climate change, which is going to be on in the next couple of months. He's going to present this landmark climate change, and it's going to be called Climate Change, the Facts. And it's not about, uh, oh, is climate change real or anything? It'll be about what scientists say is happening and what can be done about it. So it, these, to me, represent kind of big changes in the way that the, uh, that the, the, the world and the BBC has moved on in particular. And, and I think, you know, it's interesting to see that thing with David Attenborough happening at a time when the world has changed so much. And in 2018, we may look back on it and say, this was the time that everything really changed when it comes to climate change and the environment. We have record temperatures in Ireland and the UK, and scientists looked at those in attribution studies and said, actually, you know, these temperatures we had last year, they were made much more likely by the fact that there's warming in the world. And then we also had this remarkable uh, Greta Thunberg from Sweden, and the, and the outpouring of young people everywhere, cutting through the crap, if you like, and just going straight, what are you guys doing to our planet? And I mean, this movement s spread so quickly and is gaining such traction in so many parts of the world. And as well as that, last year, we also had the report that woke up the world, which was the report from the IPCC, Global Warming 1.5 Degrees, which was released in, in Korea last October. And, you know, we were very uncertain about this report before it came out because, you know, we had to commit people to go there and report on it and, you know, it cost money and all that sort of thing. Was it, was it going to have the impact? Was this the one that we should be jumping up and down about? And we came to the view that it was. And, you know, we, we got very lucky in a sense because there was a kind of a weekend window of no news in the world when Donald Trump wasn't tweeting and there was nothing happening with Brexit. And this story kind of grew and stuck and stayed current for 24 hours. And you know, I wrote a story on it, and this story on, on this particular was read by four million people. You know, it was shared on social media seven hundred and seventy-five thousand times. That's like one of the most shared stories we've had in the last two or three years. And the interesting thing from our perspective about it was the amount of time people were spending on this reading the story. They were not just casually, quickly flicking on it. They were going through it. They were looking at it. They were reading it. They were coming back to it. And so we could see from that kind of thing that. You know, it came as a surprise to us that there was such an appetite for this type of material. So, what I'm saying is that in the way that we've covered the story now, climate change is emerging, it's coming top of the news agenda pretty much all the time now. And, it's, and, and, the, and the question of these planetary issues is coming up as well. You'll have all seen the reports from Mozambique last week about Cyclone Idai. Uh, I just want to play a little bit of video. Fergal Keane, obviously, is our Africa editor. He went out there and he was covering it. But we got into the climate question very, very quickly. I'll just play this bit and you can just have a a little bit of a, uh, an idea about how we, how we cover it and how we get into that question. No? I didn't want to do that. Sorry about that. I'll have to go back and see if that works now. Good evening. It's feared hundreds of thousands of people are homeless after what's thought to be one of the worst natural disasters to hit Africa. Cyclone Idai struck the coast of East Africa four days ago, swamping Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. The United Nations says the world has yet to realize the full scale of the massive disaster. The storm made landfall on the coast of Mozambique, bringing 100 mile per hour winds and floodwaters that were swept inland. No one knows how many people may have died. The Red Cross says urgent aid is needed. In a moment, Shingai Nyoko reports from Zimbabwe, but first our Africa editor, Fergal Keane, is in the port city of Bera in Mozambique, which has been flattened. Whatever once lay here has been overwhelmed. Now the flooded land is an expanse of questions. What has become of those who lived here? Only a silence below. On very occasional moments of reprieve, these survivors landing at Baira Airport, rescued from high ground near their submerged village. Driving into the city, we saw how nature's full, awesome force had ripped through homes and lives. Ninety percent of this city has suffered destruction. And you see it in the ruins and in faces. Some food aid is now being distributed, but the relief effort is still nowhere near what's needed. Everything the storm could destroy, it did. And there is an ominous sense 
But the tragedy we have seen so far foreshadows much worse to come. Fergal King, BBC News, and Byron. Our science editor David Shipman joins me now. Such terrible destruction over such large parts of, of Africa. Is climate change to blame? It's impossible to answer that directly tonight, but I know that scientists have started working on that and will give us an answer in the next uh, few weeks, I think. But there are two ways in which climate change may have made the disaster worse. One is that we're seeing the level of the sea rise bit by bit, year by year, as the oceans warm and as the ice sheets start to melt. And that means that when you get the big waves of a storm surge, they're better able to reach further inland and cause more destruction. And at the same time, as you're getting global warming, warmer air can hold more moisture, which means that when you get rainstorms, the rain falls much more intensely. And we've seen that in Mozambique in this disaster, adding to the flooding in a very vulnerable country. Well, the, the, the thing about this is that in, when we've done reports about disasters before, there's normally maybe three or four days go by before we ask the question whether it's time to change to, to, to blame here. And here we are, we're asking that question very early on. And, and this is a very difficult, um, this, this little cyclone, it, doesn't, it isn't like a, a simple linear relationship in terms of what's going on here. The, 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 the science behind it is actually very complicated. So I, I think it's interesting that we're seeing this kind of change um, happening in, in the way that we're broadcasting news right now and going, going to these stories uh, very quickly. So I, I just want to touch on some of the things that are coming up that, we th that I think are kind of important in the next while and I think will be on top of our agenda going forward and how they will feed into what we're doing. And I think a number of them are kind of uh, obvious. So the Conference of the Parties, this climate, big climate conference happens every year. Uh, that's where the Paris Agreement is signed in Paris. Uh, we just had one in Poland last year in Katowice. These things are really becoming kind of a focal point for discussion about climate around the world. I mean, your scientists, more and more scientists are going to the COPs to present evidence there. Reports are being released there. The number of young people that, were, that was at the COP last year was just, it was incredible. I, I've been to about most of them over the last 10 years. And this was incredible. It's coming this really big forum for discussion of all sorts. And it'll be interesting next year because 19, uh, 2019, we're seeing the COP in, in, in Chile, but next year in 2020, the UK is very keen to host it, Italy wants to host it as well, it's likely to be in one of those countries, and it'll be a big moment in time as to whether countries will take on greater commitments and will put their hands up and say, we will do more, and how much more they will do, and it'll be a time of kind of reckoning in some respects, and we'll have clearer signs about where we're up to and how, far, how, much, for, how much more time we've got. So I think the, 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 the rise of the COPs will certainly be something that's going to happen. Also the IPCC, we had the IPCC come out last year with the 1.5 report. This year there are two reports coming out, one on uh, the impact of climate change on food production and one on the impact on the oceans. And these are both going to be pretty significant reports as well and I think they'll keep that agenda up there very, very high. And the IPCC in 2021 is going to produce its next assessment report which is its overall assessment of the climate. And you know, following on from 2007, 2013, 20, 2021, and that will be a key moment. They'll have better models. They'll be able to give greater levels of certainty, and I think you know that will be a, a, a very, very big moment as well. Um, also, this year we're seeing the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and uh, Environmental Services. They're producing a big report on nature, basically. What's the state of nature? Where are we up to? It's their first big report since 2005 on this. I think this will be very, very important. In, in our understanding, not just about climate change, but how we're impacting the planet generally in terms of species. And I think also, you know, we're facing into very, very tough decisions for governments everywhere, particularly governments like in, in Ireland and the UK as well. We've had the easy bits, we're doing the easy stuff on climate change, now we're into the hard bits, which are transportation and agriculture. They're the really difficult bits, and there's no easy solutions to those. So governments have a lot of thinking to do about where they go with this. And I do feel that kind of multiple factors are coming together. We're seeing this kind of rise of um, student aggression, student anger. I love this sign here, keep the air clean, it's not Uranus, you know. No broadcaster ever wants to mention the seventh planet. It's <laughs> never, never to be mentioned again. Uh, but we're seeing what's happened with plastics. Look how, look how the world has changed in terms of how we conceive of and treat plastics in five, five years or so, you know. In the, even in the last two years, we've gone from a world where we know plastics is an issue where somebody's doing something about it to becoming right there in our faces this real real issue we're seeing something similar happening now with clothing questions of fast fashion where are we going to with that there's, there's a whole range of them food production you know not just whether we should be subsidizing farmers to grow to make to make more to make more milk or milk powder or whatever it is whether or not we should be using uh, palm oil in the products that we're making you know 
population growth and migration, all these questions are coming up in the extraction industries. Where, there's almost like a rising sense that can we continue to extract more materials from the world to do something with it? And you know, should that now be much higher up the agenda? And this question of equity and fairness, they're all, I think they're all in some respects have become intermingled together. And I think it is something that we're, we're seeing basically some politicians are recognizing this as an opportunity and they're both the left and the right, I think. So in the United States, you've got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre to think that just a year ago she was working in a restaurant as a, as a bartender. Now she's in, interrogating politicians in Congress and putting them under amazing pressure and getting them, I mean, as in, she's very impressive as a politician in that respect. But the policy she's advocating, the Green New Deal, if anybody in the United States had said a couple of years ago, I got a plan, I want the United States to decarbonize in 10 years, they'd have been kind of laughed out of the room. Now you've got almost all the democratic potential contenders for president in 2020 saying, we want to back the Green New Deal or we want to take major elements on. There's a major shift in mindset going on there. The other politician for whom there's a big significant, uh, I don't know if he's still the Secretary of State for Environment, it might have changed in the last uh, number of while, uh, Michael Gove, who's, who's been very energetic in that role and has recognized the role that, that for the Conservative Party going forward, uh, past Brexit, that having some sort of green agenda is a, is a real way of tapping into those middle class voters that they want. So he's recognizing it, uh, and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is also, some, some people are recognizing it as that. So I, do, I feel personally that to me, the big dominant news story of the future is this question of our planet. The future of our uh, one and only planet is the news story that we all, I, I feel it's really emerging as our major news story. And, and I, I think it's important in that, and I'm, I'm going to kind of leave you with kind of a final thought on um, why journalism is important in that. Because it's not just saying, oh gosh, it's all terrible and it's you know, really bad and we're all going to die and all the rest of it. It is about finding solutions, but it's also about telling some truths that are not necessarily that palatable. And um, one, of the ones, the, one of the examples I like to use, if I can get it to work, is George W. Bush and his role in the Paris Climate Agreement. And, it's hard to maybe reconcile that with the way things have gone, but you know, the, the way that the Paris Agreement works, the key element of it, the bottom-up as opposed to top-down approach, was pioneered by Bush and his guys back in 2007. Now, they didn't necessarily want to make this happen, but that, but that idea came from them, and you can't say it didn't, because it did. Anyway, um, that's, that's, that's my plug for, for journalism, that, that actually has a role to play in telling some important truths. So, as I said, I... Very grateful to have had the opportunity to speak to you guys. I'm happy to take questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>